All right, grab your Bibles and buckle up. We're going to get started here. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Uh, one last thing I should have mentioned already. This little booklet you've got here uh, has space for you to take notes on Sunday. But as uh, I was realizing with a couple people here, we failed to put a spot like this, a little notes section in further, like on Wednesday night, so there is nowhere for you to take notes in here. So, go back to the um, <clears throat> prayer and praise section. There's some lines there. You can just fill it out and put what you want. That's the best I can do for you. But let me show a couple other things here. There is a daily Bible study that I would invite and really encourage each of you to get into. So, uh, for instance, we started on Monday, September the 10th. It was the first two verses of Colossians. And so here's the way we do it. You basically take the Discovery Bible method and just use the SOAP portion of it for your Bible study. So uh, you'll notice SOAP, the S is highlighted there. That's, the S is for Scripture, okay? So there's the passage. You read the Scripture a couple times. You may even pull out that same passage in one of your own translations, maybe a little different, get a little variety, see if you can get something else. The next one, though, and we didn't put these other letters in because we wanted you to be able to have flexibility with where you place things, but then the O in SOAP is observation. What do you observe about the text? And really, there are two questions. What do you see or observe about God in the text? Because it's all about God. It's all about Jesus. What do you observe about God? And then what do you observe about people within the text as well? So that's your observation. You know, so, uh, you know, for instance, oh, let's see. Yesterday, for instance, you know, we just looked at the fact, and we're going to talk about this tonight. Paul thanks God for the Colossians' faith, for their hope, for their love, that God is the one who's doing something in their lives. So you do the observation. Then the A is application. How are you going to apply it? So you usually fill in this, do it like this. I will blank. Based on what I've heard, what I've seen, I will blank. And the second part of application is I will tell blank. Who are you going to share this with? Because ours is a faith to be shared, not hoarded for ourselves. And then the P is for prayer. Just write a little prayer. Usually this is a moment to say, Lord, thank you for the gift of the text. Now I pray that I will work through this way, or you can thank him for it. It's just not time to really just sort of thank him for it, okay? So SOAP, S-O-A-P, Scripture, Observation, Application, Prayer, Every Day. And you need to know, I'm not just teaching this. Every day I'm doing this. So Monday, Tuesday, today... And tomorrow morning, I'll get up, get my cup of coffee, and I'll be going through the next section as well. I hope you will. And next week, I'm not going to do it tonight, but next week, I'd love to take a couple minutes and just say, hey, what are you seeing that stands out to you? And uh, we'll go from there, okay? Now, with that said, Colossians chapter 1, verse 3 through 14, and then verse 21 through 23. As you're turning there, I want to ask you a question. And this kind of question is a lot more fun if there's an actual response, so I'm going to ask and feel free to to dialogue with me a little bit here. I want you to think with me, what is one of your favorite topics of conversation? What is one of your favorite things to talk about? And here's the way to kind of think about that. When you don't have to talk about anything in particular... What do you tend to talk about? Let me prime the mental pump for some of you. Phil, here in the church office, Phil Cannon, he's our children's minister. Uh, If you talk to Phil for more than about 10 minutes, he's going to talk to you about his love for hiking and the trails. How many of you enjoy the great out of doors and and you like to get on the trail? And and then how many of you, when you like see the out of doors, you have to go get uh, like some medication for allergies? You just kind of like... Okay, for Phil, before he comes to work almost every day, he's been out hiking 30, 45 minutes an hour every day. And he'll tell you about it. Uh, If you talk to my sweet wife for more than a few minutes, she'll talk to you about our children because that's life for us, right? All right, so someone, what is something when you think of what you like talking about, what comes out of you first thing? Someone give me something. Hiking and traveling. Where do you like to go? Everywhere. Everywhere. If it has land or water, you're there. Is that right? If I can be there, I am. If you can be there. Very good. Okay, someone else. What do you like to talk about? Grandbabies. Grandbabies. Not kids. Grandbabies. By the way, 
it's just a rumor I've heard, but uh, for those of you who are grandparents, is grandparenthood as good as they say it is? You sugar them up and send them home, right? Good luck. This is one of those things that's like, as you did to me, I'm now doing back to you, son. And you send them on home. All right, grandbabies, travel, what else? What do you got, Ken? Hunting. Really, what do you use to hunt? Are we talking gun, arrow, bare teeth? What, what do you use? Bow, rifle, pistol, shotgun, bare hands. You just, you just, and go kill the animal. Okay, so hunting. Um, so here's the thing. If we were to take the time, every one of us, if we were to kind of just pause and say, okay, what is it that tends to come out of my mouth first? We would all recognize that we have certain things that just come out of us quickly. Uh, for some, it's going to be sports, your sports team. Some of you bleed orange. Anyone in here bleed orange? We're going to now bow our heads in prayer for our wayward bro- No, no, no. Okay, so, you know, so some of us, it's going to be we... Our sports team, for others, it's going to be a hobby. It's going to be an activity. But we all have things that when we open our mouths, certain things consistently come out of them. Now, here's what's important. Jesus himself tells us that out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. What we think dwell love is what comes out of us. Now, this is not only true with conversation. This is also true for our prayers. What you say in prayer says a lot about you. What I say in my prayer life reveals what's important to me, what I'm thinking about, what worries me. It it, it reveals what I think about God as well. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at a passage here that is just one long prayer from Paul. And we're going to see into his heart what is valuable and important to him. Now here's what I think is interesting. He starts in verse 3. He actually goes, the prayer goes all the way through verse 23. We're going to skip about five or six verses, verse 15 through 20, and deal with those on Sunday because they are so dense we can't even crack them this evening and get through it. But I want you to see what Paul says, and he's going to lay out his heart to the church in these verses. So here we go. Colossians chapter 1, verse 3 and following says this. We always thank God. God. By the way, he says we because in verse 1 he says that it is both he and his fellow companion in ministry, Timothy, who are sort of sharing this book. Correct? So we thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints, the faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. Verse 13. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Now, jump down to verse 21 and we'll finish it. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, 
have become a servant. This is the word of the Lord. So Paul is talking about things he loves. What do you hear him talking about, church? Just throw out some of the things that you heard him bring up in this passage. Glance back over if you need to. We've got a couple extra minutes because of our venue tonight. So go ahead, look at it, and then throw something out. What's that? Grace. Does Paul care about grace? Absolutely. Read Romans. It's all over the place. By the way, grace is all over this little book. We said this Sunday, he begins the book with grace in verse 2. And if you go to the last verse of the last chapter of this little letter, he ends with grace. So grace, absolutely. What else? What's this? The love of God's people. He cares about the church, doesn't he? Okay, what else? I heard something back here. Oh, faith and love, yeah. So he cares about faith. Again, read any of Paul's writings. You'll hear this over and over again. What else do you see? Cares about the truth. Boy, do you think our country needs a healthy dose of truth couched in grace? Oh, man. Do you think the church of Jesus Christ needs to reaffirm the truth Couched in love and grace. I think this is maybe more applicable to us than we sometimes think, isn't it? All right, what else do you see? Good works. Good works, okay. So he's going to talk a little bit about something that we do. Uh, and, but now, that also, for some of you, that's going to throw up a red flag, isn't it? Because you know Paul is all against legalistic good works. So what's going on here? We'll, we'll deal with that. That's great, though, Becky. Okay, what else? Wisdom and understanding. All right, so he's going to just keep kind of pouring these things out. So here's what I want you to notice first. Notice that Paul has a deep, deep care for these things we're going to talk about tonight. Because when he opens his mouth to talk to God, by the way, if I were to compare my prayer life to Paul's, the reality is most of the time my prayer life it is almost organized like a Christmas wish list to Santa Claus than the kind of prayer that Paul's praying. Now, I'm not throwing guilt on you, and yours may be similar, but I want us to think deeper about what is meaningful and what is going on here. It's not simply, please help me today, please give me grace tomorrow, please, you know, with this job interview, or, hey, look, we want a house, we're looking for a house, Lord, give us a house. It's great to pray for those things. But notice his prayer is not simply about me, me, me. He's got a lot. Okay, so this reveals something. If you want to write some things down, I think we can categorize what he says, what he does in three little things. And if you want to, uh, as a preacher, this is all going to start with the letter P. Okay, so here we go. But I want us to see some things that he's going to deal with here. In verses 3 through 8, the very first thing he starts in his prayer is he praises God. You say, wait a minute, I don't think he praises God. He's talking to them about their good things. Well, okay, let's talk about this for a moment. Do you notice? He says, boy, you know, I love your faith. I love your hope. I love your love. You've got the gospel, all these great things. But do you notice how he begins the letter? We, what's that word? Thank God. Now, this is an interesting little thing. A few weeks ago, I celebrated my 36th birthday. Yes, I'm still a little child. Thank you for asking. My wife and my kids, they gave us gifts, and we were, uh, you know, gave me gifts, and we were having a good time, and and it was great. You know, I got got a gift card to Starbucks. I've told you about this because I love Starbucks. It's my little addiction. I I got an iTunes gift card because I love iTunes. That's the other one. Pray for me. Um, And then, you know, and so I got these little gifts from my wife and my kids. Now, can you imagine if after I got the gifts, I got up and went, yippee! I got up, I run out the front door, I go next door, I knock on the neighbor's house, they open the door and I go, thank you so much for my iTunes card. Two things would happen. Number one, they would look at me like I was crazy. And number two, it would be a very cold night with the rest of my family. Because I was giving thanks to someone who did not give me the gift I received. You thank the one who ultimately is the giver of what you have received. Paul is making an incredibly important point here. He does not look at the church and say, I thank you for your faith. I thank you for your love. 
I thank you for your hope. He says, I thank God. Because any good gift you or I have comes from whom, church? Comes from God. James 1.17. Every good and perfect gift comes down from God. So anything you and I have, anything that you have today as a Christ follower or had before coming to Christ is the good gift and mercy of God. Even while we were still sinners, do you realize he poured out his grace on each of us? We call it common grace. He let you wake up and take a breath even though you were an enemy of God. He gave you life. He gave you taste buds. Can I get an amen for taste buds? Man, how many of you enjoy... Okay, okay, so any of you go to El Mateo or Matate, Matito, whatever it's called there? That place down the road. There's something spiritual about getting a tortilla, a little fajita meat, cheese, guacamole, sour cream. Some of you are going, "Mm, oh no, it's good. It's from God. And then all those things, they go together and they create something that was not before when they weren't mixed together. Long before you and I ever figured out how to combine flavors for something new, our Heavenly Father said, oh, just wait until you figure out how to really smoke a good piece of meat. (laughs) It's going to be great. Our God gave you these gifts. So let's just kind of track back what he says. Okay, faith, hope, love. I love that you are a faithful group of people, that you have faith in Jesus Christ. I'm so thrilled that you have a hope in God and your hope is rooted not in something that can change here on earth, but it is linked to and rooted in heaven. By the way, you need to understand something. When he uses the word heaven, he's not talking about a place. This is really important. Most religions, when they talk about the the focus of our faith, it is a place For Christians, it is a person. It's not a place where our hope or our joy or our life comes from. So when he says heaven, the only reason heaven will be heaven is because Jesus is there. Does this make sense? Hell is hell because Jesus and the goodness of God and the glory of God is not there. It is a separation from God. This is why when you get Jesus, you get heaven now. This is why Jesus was able to tell us to pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth just as it is where? In heaven. The only way that's possible is if God truly is with us. Emmanuel, God with us. You get this? So faith, hope, love. So the example that we get from Christ. Now here's the interesting thing. Where do they receive these things? Did they just come up with hope on their own? Faith on their own? No, they heard about it through the gospel. You say, oh, so it's the gospel that gave it to them. Well, where did they get the gospel? Well, we're told right here. The gospel was shared first with them. Notice this. In verse 7, you learned it from, who is that? Epaphras or Epaphras or or, or whatever emphasis you want to give to his name, but this guy named Epaphras came. He was originally from Colossae. He then goes probably to Ephesus during the time when Paul was imprisoned in Ephesus, meets Paul, hears about Jesus, comes to faith, goes back to Colossae, says, you will not believe what I've just heard. And he helps plant the church there. Now here's what's important. Notice their faith, hope, love was shared through the gospel, or the gospel is the good news, but it came from a man named Epaphras. So should Paul be saying, yay, praise Epaphras? No. Well, where did Epaphras hear of the gospel and the good news? From Paul. So should Paul say, well, hey, praise me? I mean, is this sort of a passive-aggressive way of, or a humble brag like, hey, praise me for your good? No. Where did Paul hear the good news of Jesus? From Jesus himself. The church in Colossae has faith, hope, and love because of Jesus Christ. Shared, shared, shared. But it's all from God. This is why Paul starts and he says, I praise God for what you have. Everything you have is from God. Hey, here's a really good quick question for you tonight. Maybe we could think on this. When was the last time you thanked God for what you have right now? 
And I know a lot of us, you know, when we look at where we need to go and how we need to grow, a lot of us kind of go, oh, I'm not where I need to be. And oh, and that's true. We all have growth areas. But ha- when was the last time you paused? And instead of just saying, oh, I should be, I should be, I should be, when was the last time you paused and said, oh, wow, look where God has brought me? Oh, but for the grace of God, I know where I'd be. And look where I am because of God. When was the last time we praised him? And so Paul, when he, pray- when he starts, he says, let's praise God. And then the second part that he goes into, if you'll notice this, He then, let me get my spelling correct here. He then petitions God. He petitions God, verse 9 and following. Notice what he says here. He says, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped, what's that word? Praying. We've not stopped praying for you. And then, and asking God. God to fill you. Notice, he praises God. He says, thank you for all that they have. Thank you for the growth that they are experiencing. Thank you for the maturity they have. But then he says, I'm now going to petition God for future growth. See, I think this is so important. Before we get into the mode of, I've got to do, 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 I've got to do all these things, we have to remember that what we have came from God and what we will have can only come from God as well. So here's, the, here's sort of the mental picture I, I think is so interesting here. He uses this phrase, he says, I pray and I'm asking God to fill you up. Now, now, by the way, if he has to pray for us to be full, does that mean that we are already full? Yes or no? No. No. Now, here's the thing. Some of the people go, no, we're not full. There's a difference between being complete and being full. For instance, let's go back to that moment when you saw your child or your grandbaby or your niece or your nephew for the first time. This little one comes out. And by the way, when they come out, they look like something from a horror movie. And they're screaming like something from a horror movie. And it's only because they came from you that you're like, oh, they're so beautiful. No, they're not yet. They're really not. But anyway, they come out and, and you see this little person. What's the first thing you do? You count the fingers and toes. You look, okay, they've got two eyes and they're on the right part of the body. I mean, this is good news. And you look and, oh, they've got two ears. They've got one mouth. They've got a little nose. And, and oh, look, he's got your smirk. And whatever else it may be. But you look and you see the picture of the child. The child at birth is complete. But the child at birth is not fully mature. Paul says, I know you're you're complete in Christ. You've been saved. You will never be more saved than you are right now. Isn't that good news? That You don't have to be more saved later. But he does say, you're not quite full yet. There's growth. There's maturity that happens, which honestly... If you know yourself like, you know, I know me, first thing I do in the morning is I go and I look in the mirror and, and yes, it, pray for me. This is what I have to look at when I get up in the morning. It's just sad, you know, Shrek size head, um, you know, bald spot, all that, okay? So, I mean, it's just, it's a, but here's the reality. I know me, and if this is the best that I get, that is depressing because I know where my sin is and the areas where I'm weak. My wife she is so graceful, she would never do this, but she could give you a list of areas where I need to grow up. Isn't it good news that God doesn't say, hey, you're saved, now good luck, but he says, okay, I'm gonna continue and I want to make you full. I want to mature you. And so he petitions God to do that. Now let's go back to that moment, that picture. The baby is born. How goofy. Here's the thing. A lot of us as Christians, we come to faith, we come to follow Christ, and we say, yay, you did this for me, but now don't worry, I've got it. You save me, I'll do the rest of it. It'd be like that little baby who comes out screaming and crying and then stopping and going, hey mom, dad, thanks for giving me life. Well, this has been great. You did a good job. Now I, I got the rest of it. We'd all go, no, you don't. And so Paul says, okay, if you want to grow, you need to understand that growth comes only by the divine grace of God. It is his work in you and through you that we become who he has always designed for us to be. So he petitions him. And he goes on in this petition. He says, let me show you what this looks like. And this is incredible, the list of things. Notice how specific he is in petitioning God. 
He says, verse, <clears throat> verse 10, we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way. In how many ways? Every way. He goes, bearing fruit in every good work. How many good works? Every good work. He says, growing in the knowledge of God. So we're not just going to be saved. We're going to grow in, in, in our knowledge of God. By the way, God is not honored if we're consistently ignorant of who he is. Um, one of the things about marriage that has been so interesting is you think you know the person so well before you get married, and then you get married. And, and, and isn't that first like six months to a year just a real, I mean, it's like a splash of cold water because you're like, oh my goodness, you're a human being. I didn't know you were a human being because of course when you're dating, that person's not a human. They just float and everything's, but you then learn they're not perfect and they have these things and you get to know them better. And the most beautiful thing is now, Lindsay and I, we're, we're coming up on about 13 years of marriage. Thir- okay, good. And, and we're, so we're coming up on 13 years in December. I, I know her more now than I did the day we got married. It would not be honoring or loving for me to say, I love you, but I don't grow in knowing who she is. And so God says, know me. He goes on, look at what else? He says, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. So he's now praying for their empowerment so that we may have great endurance so we get through what we're going through. By the way, if life were easy and good when you got saved, he would not pray for our endurance. But life sometimes gets harder when you follow Jesus. But endurance and patience and then joyfully, he's praying that we will joyfully give thanks to the Father. So notice this, he is so specific. God will save you, but then he petitions God to do the work in us that we can't do on our own. And so this means that as we're thinking about how we interact with God in prayer, this may be part of it as well. Now, he goes on. Let me move on to the last thing. The last thing he does here, and I think this is so interesting. Oh, one more point on that. One interesting thing. Some people say, yeah, 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 but I think I'm still the one who's doing it. Do you notice all the different tenses, the verb tenses? It's what God has done, what they have received. They are the passive recipients It's not what they earned, what they did. It's what they've received, what God has done. And so throughout this, I want us to pay attention that it's God's work in us that changes us. Now, the last thing he says this. He prays God. He petitions God. And then he says, but listen, you do have a part. And I love what you said, Becky. And this is where we go from here. He says, you really need a partner with God. So in his prayer, he praises God, petitions God, and then he says, hey, this is how it looks to partner with God. Verse 23, he says this. Let's go back, actually, one verse. He says in verse 22, but now he, God, has reconciled you by Christ's physical body. By the way, we'll explain why that phrase is so important on Sunday. By Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Now here's the thing. This is all dependent. If... You continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. So now, uh, if you're a legalist like me or a recovering legalist, you're going to look at that and say, see, I knew it. I knew it. It's really up to us. That He says he's going to do this, but I've got to do it now. That's not what he's saying. That's not what he's saying. Um, somebody, anyone have a coffee cup in hand? Anyone? Is this empty? Oh, good. May I borrow it? That'd be all right. Mm. All right, so a little coffee cup here. You say, okay, how do we partner with God where it's not all about us? Because that's really the challenge here, I think, especially for, uh, just show of hands, how many of you grew up in the churches of Christ? The church of Christ? No? Hey, man, good job. Welcome. Um, I love our heritage. I would not be a part of the Church of Christ today if I did not love our heritage. I'm grateful for the Churches of Christ because this is where I was raised and brought up. But every church has some issues, and one of ours has been we have taken God's place saying it's our job to do God's work, that we are the ones responsible for changing ourselves, that if we just try hard enough, if we get the checklist just right, then we'll be okay, then we can figure it out. I don't know about you, but that is an exhausting way to live. One thing that you'll, and again, I'm going to be very honest with you, and I hope you can be with me, 
Growing up, I dealt with depression. I went to see a psychiatrist for a number of years growing up. And a lot of that came back to the fact that I thought that it was up to me to be good enough. It doesn't work. So you say, well, okay, so what is it then? Do we partner? Do we, how does this work? And Paul gives us a beautiful picture back again. Let's go back to verse 9. Notice what he says here. I'm asking God, I'm asking God to fill you up. So let's just talk about a cup for a minute here, okay? Every person in this room is in many ways a vessel, right? This is what Paul will say in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, that we are jars of clay. In this case, uh, we are more, whatever that is, paper. But we are vessels, And Paul is going to say that God will fill us up. That's what he's praying for, that God will mature us. He will grow us up. But we have a choice to be filled or not filled. And really, it's as simple as saying, I can't put anything in this cup if other things are already in the cup. Um, One of my favorite places to go, and and I've never been with my wife because... Well, I've seen their health score, and she has too, so she doesn't go. But anyway, one of the, one of the places I like to go is, uh, is Waffle House. And part of it is you get there. Okay, now the one here is good. The one in Nashville. Okay, but the one, do you get in there? You get your little cup of coffee. One of the things I like about it is they have the coffee cups. They have like the thicker lip, so it feels like you really got something substantive to drink from. I mean, just, oh, I love it. So I sit there, and, and you get a little cup of coffee, and you finish it. Oh, it's so good. But what's funny is the lady comes over and says, hey, would you like more? Have you ever said to her, yeah, I'd like some, but I don't want any in the bottom half. I just want it up here in the top half. Could you just fill the top half for me? <laughs> and I, I, go ahead and try it. I mean, she'll just go, I, I mean, that's what it's going to be. But here's the reality. She cannot fill up here unless she fills down here as well. And she cannot fill down here unless it's empty of what's already in it. The partnership with God is a process not of doing and striving. It is a process of simply emptying. I cannot be full of God if, and you may want to write this down, I cannot be full of God if I'm full of myself. Ever meet someone who's full of themselves? Always about themselves. So let me give you how we partner with God. I think Paul has just modeled it beautifully in this passage. Did you notice what he's done Let me show you these three things, and we'll be done tonight. Notice this, and this all comes from, all from here. Number one, the first thing that he does, and if you want to empty yourself, and if you want to be available to God to continue to fill you up, number one, do what he just has done through this whole thing. Thank God. Let me go back to that question I asked earlier. When was the last time you intentionally recited to God his goodness to you. It's hard to be full of me when I'm thinking on him. It's hard to be full of my issues, my worries, my concerns, my pettiness when I am focused on thankfulness to God. By the way, not just thankfulness to God. When was the last time you thanked God for God and when was the last time you thanked God for others? Now again, I think... Okay, can we just be honest? Okay, we're, we'll pretend like the tape's not rolling here, just for a moment here. If we're honest, isn't it true that much of the time when we pray to God about other people, it's not because we're saying, God bless that person. It's Nashville, Tennessee, Interstate 24. I believe that it is one of the first stages of hell. It is a horrible place to be. Uh, I mean, it's just a, a terrible. The number of times that I was either cut off or flipped off is astounding, And I can tell you, the heart that I had often was not reflective of God. I was not playing, oh Lord, please bless them. Take good care of them. Extend to them long life. No, I was saying, dear Lord, will you please smite them as you smote the enemies of Israel. That's what I'm praying. But here's the thing. It is hard to be full of God if I'm full of myself. And so long as it's me, 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 it's going to be all about me. And the fullness of God is going to be hard to be experienced and seen if it's all about me. One of the greatest remedies is do what Paul did. Don't just praise God for God, but praise God for others. Do you think Paul could have probably shared some things to the church about the church that they weren't doing right? Come on, they're human, of course. He doesn't, not one. I thank God for you. 
you want to be full of God and not full of yourself, thank God for others, thank God for himself. Number two, it's just what we've talked about here. You want to take the praise of others, not just to God, but to them, so encourage others. Encourage others. Here's the big idea on that one. It is so interesting within the church, you'll often hear people talk positively about someone else behind their back. No, no, this is good stuff, okay? We're not, that's not a euphemism for gossip, okay? But you'll hear someone, like, it'll be like, you know, I'll be talking to someone like, man, you know, Mark, man, he's just a champ. He, he, he works hard. I mean, he works seven days on, seven days off, and he, he works hard, and his sweet wife, Tara, she's wonderful. And I could tell you this, and that's beneficial, but it would be even more so to say to him, man, I see in you Jesus Christ and the way that you love your family by the way you provide for them and the way that you work hard and the way that you care for them when you're off your hours. And then to look at Tara and say, my word, I see Jesus Christ in you by the way that you care for your family when your husband is gone for seven days working. That we, you want to be full of God and not full of yourself, you encourage other people. That's what Paul is doing through this whole thing, isn't it? The whole letter is one giant encouragement. And notice he's not general about it. He's specific, meaning he knows them and he's paying attention to them. You want to be someone who can be used by God, filled up by God, thank God for God, thank God for others, and then encourage other people. Find ways to be a voice of encouragement. Husband, can I give you a challenge? When you get off work, and I know many of you women, you work as well, but let me just talk to the men for a moment here. Men, when you get off work and you've had a long day and your boss has been uh, not the nicest to you, maybe this project didn't go well or this thing happened or maybe the customers were just real pain or whatever it may be, I know you're tired. And the last thing you want to do is to be on for a few more hours. But as a brother in Christ, let me just tell you, when you get married, you don't get one job, you get two. You're on during the day for your 8, 10, 12, 14, however many hour shift, and then you go home for your second shift to pour into your sweet wife that God has been so good to give you. And if you've got children, actually, that's going to be your second shift. When they go to bed, then it's third shift, take care of your wife. And then after that, it's yours. But here's what I want to say to you. Just because you've had a long day, don't think that your wife hasn't also had a long day. The number of times I've come home and my sweet wife, I mean, she is such a good gift from God, but there's been a couple times... Where I come home, and, and, and she, um, she does a really good job of being a verbal encourager, but she sometimes can't mask the way she feels on her face. Any of you have a face that says what you feel? It's like, I'm so glad to be here. <laughs> All right, don't hulk out. And so, I mean, the times I've come home, and, and, and she'll, she, she is saying all the nice things, and she's being, but, but I mean, you can just tell, I mean, it's been a day, and, and I looked for, children, are you still here? Are you okay? I look for body parts, but they're okay, and, and so, on the, I'm joking, and so I come home. She, in that moment, needs encouragement. She does not need for me to lay more onto her. So find ways to encourage, find ways. The greatest gift, other than salvation, for me, has been this woman. And I pray to God that I get to live long enough to grow old with her where we become saggy and baggy and wrinkled and hairless and we get to love each other doing it. Because she's a good gift. Third thing and finally, after you thank God and encourage others, share what you've received. Share what you've received. Have you noticed that a cup cannot be filled or filled unless it's already been emptied? It's my deep conviction that most people in the church do not need ever again to attend another Bible class or Sunday morning worship. We know all that we really need to do, don't we, Jack? Hey, what's that statement that was said years and years ago? I learned everything I needed to know by the time I was three and learned this song. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. The truth is we know plenty. Some of us are waiting to be filled by God and he's waiting us to empty out what we've already received onto other people. Our cup cannot be refilled unless we begin to pour out what we've already received and share it with others. So one of the things that's happened 
The times of greatest spiritual growth in my life are the times that I've been in deep fellowship with other people, sharing life, and then they share the pain or the struggle in their life, and they say, why, or how do I, or what about? It's interesting. If you want to grow in your faith and knowledge and understanding and love of God, meet with people, because in those moments, they're going to ask you questions and deal with things that are going to force you to go back to the Bible, to the source, to know the answers. And you'll grow more than you ever will just sitting in a class. And you all know this, don't you? How many of you read parenting books? How many of you parented kids? Where did you learn more? It's in the trenches, isn't it? What's that now? No, the kids don't come. I looked for instructions for about a week, and then I realized they just just come with other stuff, right? So, yeah. So here's the thing. If you want to... Partner with God, it's as simple as doing what Paul did. Thank God, encourage others, share what you've received. And let me give you one bonus thing that doesn't fit in my little scheme here, but I think it's too cool not to share. Last thing, notice verse 12. Notice the good news. You say, well, what what about those days where this just doesn't seem worth it or I just can't? Okay, look what he says. This is so cool. And we'll end on this. He wants us to joyfully give thanks to the Father who has, notice this, qualified you. He's the one who ran the race and then gave you his position. He qualified you to share in the, do you get that word there? Inheritance. How many of you know what an inheritance is? Not, maybe you've not received one, but you know what they are. How many of you would love to get an inheritance? What if you found out that Bill Gates was some distant relative and you're the guy or you're the girl who's on his will and you get everything? You get the inheritance. Anyone in here a little excited about that idea? Man, I'm telling you, I don't think buying a house would be a problem anymore. I mean, we just, we'll buy them all, and and then it would be set. Inheritance, notice this though, he says, he has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of life, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Here's the thing, If if nothing else I've said kind of geeks you out, I want you to think on this for a moment. An inheritance, especially in the first century in the Jewish culture, if you were the firstborn, you received the dominant share of inheritance. You got not just daddy's stuff, but equally important, you got daddy's status, his authority. You were the one that everyone listened to now. Jesus Christ has the full inheritance of God the Father. How do you get an inheritance, family? What must occur before an inheritance can be passed on? Somebody's got to die. And so on the cross, Jesus Christ gave up his life, gave up his inheritance, and in the moment of his death, hear me now, the good news says that his inheritance as the Son of God passed on to you. All of daddy's stuff All of his authority, all of his familial connections are now yours. And what should that information lead us back to? Praise to God. I want to grow, be more like this one who gives me what I have. I'm going to partner with him, and then that just leads back into more praise, more partner, more. Do you see how this works? This is the prayer that Paul prayed and invites us now to pray. And so with every eye closed, every head bowed, let's just pray to this good God and close this evening. Father, we thank you, thank you, thank you that you have given us life, that our bodies are animated, that this evening you gave us ears to hear, that you've given us eyes to read scripture, that we've been able to open a word from our brother in the faith over two millennia ago. And to be able to know now the truths that he shared through the Spirit to this church. I thank you that you gave us the privilege of being taught the word of God. That there was an Epaphras who came to us. And that here we are, centuries later, half a world away. Different language. And yet you, by your grace, gave us this good life and relationship with you. Jesus, thank you. Father, we praise you for it. Lord, I thank you for this church. We thank you for one another. And boy, the church is a great gift from you. Lord, may we never speak badly about your wife, the church. 
Father, thank you for life. Thank you for the church. Thank you now also that we get to partner with you going out here. May we thank you. May we encourage others. May we share what we've received, even what we've heard tonight, so that we would be filled to overflowing and that what spills out of us is your goodness to the world around us, to the praise and glory of Jesus Christ. And all who agree say, amen. God bless. You're dismissed.